Welcome to the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries Lunch and Learn series. As you can tell, we're doing these remotely this year, as are many of you participating in online webinar such things. My name is Paul Anderson. I'm the Executive Director for the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. We're based in Stonington, Maine. And I'm pleased that you're joining us today for a conversation about how aquaculture is uh, being uh, played out in Eastern Maine, at least some forms of it. And we have four expert panelists from uh, different approaches to uh, uh, marine aquaculture here in this part of the state with us this afternoon. And they'll each take a moment to uh, share their experience. And I hope we've um, organized some exciting, informative uh, brief talks and we'll leave enough room for, um, for discussion and questions later on. Um, just real quickly, the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries, many of you know us, um, has been around for about 16 years. We were once first known as Penobscot East Resource Center, changed their name to Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries, and our founding director, Robin Alden, retired, and I had the pleasure to come on board a few years ago. We're a small um, nonprofit doing great big things out of Stonington. We have a team of scientists and, uh, and other staff that help to do our work, which is primarily focused on commercial fishing and and uh, the communities that depend on them, but we also have a great conscience around the community development needs and the seafood economy. And, uh, and so aquaculture is an, a very important part of that. So in fact, we're, we're trying to figure out at the center how exactly we can help uh, our communities um, understand aquaculture and embrace it. And so this webinar bringing this topic into our series is, uh, is part of our own uh, pursuit of knowledge around how aquaculture works. So we're here very excited to have some experts talking about this with you today. Um, you'll also see on the screen Pat Shepard is is in the office and Pat will help me with moderating questions later on in the in the uh, webinar. Um, these have been very successful lately. Thank you all for joining us. We had uh, just over a hundred registrants for today's um, webinar as has been the case for the previous ones this summer. Uh, in the end, um, not all of those people end up showing up, but we, we really enjoyed uh, some pretty good uh, discussions and a lot of uh, interesting uh, input from uh, our Q&A sessions and people from really around the country, whereas normally we'd be in our conference room and there might be 25 of us squeezed in, squeezed in, squeezed in, listening in, listening to. It's actually been an interesting opportunity to expand um, you know, our audience and expand our, our perspectives that we can enjoy with your participation. Um, clearly today we're talking about um, a few types of aquaculture, not the entire aquaculture universe. There's a lot of different types of marine and, and aquaculture uh, playing out on the world and in Maine. Um, so today we're primarily focusing on the unfed aquaculture species and uh, you'll get a taste of that as we go through the presentations, as you know, there are other types of aquaculture going on and a real new growth recently in land-based aquaculture. That's really not our topic for today, but perhaps it's something that we would explore in our series next year. Um, so with me today is uh, Sarah Redmond from Springtide Seaweed. Uh, Evan Young is uh, with Blue, Blue Hill Bay Mussels, and Evan has not yet joined us, but I'm hoping he, uh, he arrives. Uh, Fiona DeConing is here with us from Acadia Aqua Farms, and Marsden Brewer um, is here from Penn Bay Scallops. So as you can tell, we're going to hear about uh, a range of species, and uh, we have both PowerPoints and, um, and a series of uh, uh, videos that we hope will, will transmit well. Sometimes videos work well in the Zoom platform, sometimes they're a little clunky. Um, Hold on, I had, I had a question from someone um, asking if this is available to the public. You have to register to, to uh, join us um, as, as you were able to. So if you have somebody else that wants to join, they can go and register and probably enter whenever they like. Um, <clears throat> hey, Evan. Well, Hello. Welcome. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thanks for being there. I just did a quick intro and uh, told folks that you were on your way. And there you are. Thanks for joining us. So we're going to go in the order of the intros that I just had. And, and I've asked each of the speakers to limit their time to about 10 minutes. 
And I'd like to go through all four if possible and preserve your questions for the end of the, the session. So write them down as you go through or enter them into the Q&A or the chat box that you see at the bottom of your screen. So I'm going to uh, share my screen and let Sarah Redman um, talk to you about, uh, let me get to, I have to pull this up in a different way, let's see. Okay. okay, hope everybody can see that video. Sarah, go ahead. Yes, and you can hear me okay, so I'm, I'm ready to go? Yep. Okay, um, so down east Maine, or as some would have it, Penobscot East, is a very different coastal area than southern or mid-coast Maine. I'm Sarah Redman, the founder of Springtide Seaweed, the largest vertically integrated organic seaweed operation in the United States and founded in 2017 and we grow and sell farm seaweed. We're located up in Frenchman Bay, a large deep water bay that's surrounded by the towns of Bar Harbor, Goolsboro, Sorrento, um, Winter Harbor and a very unique position we're in here. Um, we have two farm sites. You can see one is the blue square and the other is uh, on the map as fish pens. It used to be an old salmon farm. That's why it says that now it's a seaweed farm. And our facility is located in South Goldsboro, right around the corner from our farms. And uh, it's at the site of an old um, fish hatchery. So we're right on the water. And this is the view from the front of our facility. And um, you can see this is uh, our South Goldsboro Harbor and it's home to mostly lobster fishing boats with very few recreational boats. Very important piece of working waterfront infrastructure here for the area. There's one lobster wharf, there's a boat ramp and there's an old lobster pound here. And uh, just really a lifeline for all the people that work out of this area. So we grow and sell different types of seaweed. Um, mainly we, we grow four types of kelp and we use, mostly dry the seaweed and powder it into flakes. And we make a seasoning blend uh, lineup. So these are salt-free uh, nutritional seasoning blends to help people get seaweed into their everyday diet. And this is just a way to introduce people um, to the benefits and uses of seaweed, but mainly our markets are sort of the wholesale markets. So we sell um, dried seaweed powders and flakes to um, manufacturers that are looking to source sustainable, healthy ingredients for their products. Seaweeds are an incredible source of nutrients from the ocean and provide a range of vitamins and minerals we miss in our normal everyday foods. So how do you take this incredibly mysterious and um, wild ancient plant and domesticate it? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. So this is sort of day one of agriculture on land. If you think about how we've taken wild plants and domesticated them to grow the crops that we have today. So the process starts for the kelps by collecting the reproductive material. And this is called the source tissue because it produces spores. And um, you clean that up and gently desiccate it. And then when released in seawater, uh, when resubmerged seawater, it releases the spores. So these are microscopic, tiny little swimming spores that are looking for a solid place to sell pretty immediately um, so they can go through their microscopic sexual phase called uh, the gametophyte stage. So these are the spores swimming around and um, they pretty quickly settle and germinate and then start dividing and create these tiny little microscopic filaments, which are actually separate male and female stages of the plants. And these have to reproduce and find each other. And so the egg is fertilized by the male and the young baby kelp plant is produced. So this is um, a tiny kelp plant you see on a string fragment 
And so we settle these spores onto what we call seed string on uh, spools, which are just PVC pipes. And they are allowed to grow up to a couple of millimeters in length. And this is what you have for a seed spool. So this is your kelp seed. And we are an organically certified nursery and we provide seed to a number of farms around the state. And we um, can even support people from out of state if they give us spores from their local areas. Um, this is sort of a general layout of a farm and sort of what a horizontal long line looks like under the water. And so uh, the gear is very simple. You have moorings and then you have lines suspended between those moorings. And that's where you put your, your kelp seed. So to seed your farm, this happens in the fall, you put a, a sink rope through your pipe and then you tie one end off and then the string will unravel around your line. And that is seeding your line. It's very quick, it's very efficient. Um, and then your kelp plants will then be growing off of the seed string and wrapping their hold fast around the rope to hold on through the season. So you put your seed out in the fall and you check your farm throughout the winter and the kelp is gonna grow up with the help of sunshine and seawater and the nutrients naturally found in the seawater, especially in the winter, the nitrogen levels are um, plentiful for the kelp. And they start very small, but then they quickly grow to be um, just incredible, huge abundance of plants. And so in the spring, you have this huge crop of, of seaweed that you have to then pull out of the water. In um, the early spring, we can start harvesting um, one of the kelps that we grow. So they all have sort of different seasonalities. We, we can use small boats. And then as the weather is calmer, you can go out with bigger boats. This is uh, one of our harvesting barges. Um, this allows you to sort of pull the line up to a place that you can work with it and gives you a working platform. So um, we are organically certified, so we're very careful um, and we care very much about quality and safety. So we pack our seaweed into clean fish totes with covers and we bring them into a greenhouse where we hang them up to dry. Um, greenhouse drying is a traditional method for drying seaweed. It's um, energy efficient. And so we grow a number of different species. Um, the sugar kelp is the one we saw earlier. This is one is called wing kelp or Elaria. And Elaria has a midrib that runs all the way up the blade. Uh, Elaria is very interesting because it's not as plentiful in the wild and um, it has a slightly different nutritional profile being lower in iodine and higher in some of the other essential elements like iron and calcium. And um, so they all have different seasonalities and different requirements for when you put your seed out and when you harvest. Um, but the challenges around farming in the winter are um, the, the weather, obviously. So this is a skinny kelp. This is a unique kind of morphotype that's found only in one place off the coast of Maine that we're farming. Um, this is a horsetail kelp, which is a seaweed that produces high amounts of alginates or the sort of slipperiness that you can get from a kelp sometimes. This is our one of our nori species, so we're also working on developing cultivation strategies for the valuable red seaweeds, dulse and nori. And this is the red seaweed dulse, which is very popular food in um, the North Atlantic from US Canada over to Europe. One thing about being on the water on a farm is you get to see changes in the ocean. And so sometimes that's exciting and seeing the fish come back. And sometimes it's concerning seeing the, the water temperatures rise and sort of an increase in biofouling organisms and those types of things. Um, so the question really, as we, as we look out on to the future, um, and this is for me very near and apparent, is what's gonna happen to this working waterfront infrastructure, what's gonna to happen to our lobster fishery, what's gonna to happen to our relationship with the ocean if we don't start um, laying the groundwork now for looking at new ways to work with the ocean. And so we have all seen the changes um, our society has gone through with, with our relationship to the ocean and, and sort of working from a former cannery, which was a fishery that sort of, in an industry that sort of came and went 
the question is for us to decide what what's going to happen next. That's that's the end. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. That was very informative. The video came out good. I hope everybody got a good uh, view of that. That's Sarah Redmond from Springtide um, Seaweed. We're going to move on to our next speaker, who is Evan <coughs> Young, here from Blue Hill Bay Mussels. Go ahead, Evan. Uh, this is a video of uh, the salt pond uh, where our hatchery is. Uh, we put these lines in the water at the beginning of July, and this is October. We're harvesting seed. Uh, this all comes on naturally. Um, so we'll uh, harvest this and put them on our grow outside site on the east side of Hardwood Island in Blue Hill Bay. Uh, we've been doing this since 1999. Um, as Sarah says, we are seeing all kinds of changes and uh, trying, to de trying to develop as the changes do. So uh, we'll go into more of that later in the videos, but this is just for the salt pond. So we put these lines in, like I say, and uh, nothing on them. And uh, within three months, we're harvesting this seed here. Um, and then uh, after we uh, take it out to our site, this is us putting the seed on our ropes. Uh, the Spanish socking machine, the rope goes through it. It puts a, the seed inside, the, inside a sock and it allows the muscles to attach to the ropes. Uh, after about three weeks, the cotton all dissolves and uh, you have just uh, the muscles hanging on all by themselves. Uh, very clean way to do it. Uh, I like this method mainly because we're utilizing the water column. column. We're not taking a big footprint out of the area. Uh, this grow outside is only about three acres in size and uh, at ultimate uh, capacity, we can grow 400,000 pounds of mussels a year on this site. So uh, we're not taking up much area. Uh, there is still lobster fishing going on around us. So uh, we're sharing our lease as well. Um, After uh, this video is almost over, this part is almost over, and then we'll go on to uh, our harvest stage. Uh, right now we harvest year round, uh, two days a week. 95% um, of our product goes to wholesalers out of state. Um, there are a few local restaurants and individuals that will come to the shop and get some stuff as they want. Uh, but this cotton just wraps around and holds out those muscles right there for, for about three weeks and then the cotton's all gone. Our ropes are, we're in about uh, 80 feet of water uh, and our ropes are 50 feet long. Um, so as I say, we're using uh, most of the water column Here we are harvesting uh, with our conveyor belt that slides in over the, the corner of the raft. Uh, the mussels uh, are just uh, pulled in. When we first started, uh, we did this all by hand. We have mechanized a, a long ways. Uh, we started out with a 24 foot Carolina skiff and uh, this is what we have nowadays. So uh, we've, we've come a long ways and uh, in the years, uh, the the product uh, we put it on the raft. It uh, stays on the raft from uh, twelve to sixteen months. Uh, we'll start harvesting at a smaller size because all the mussels are pretty much the same age. So uh, to try to stay in the good size that the market wants, we have to start early so they don't get too big, but uh, not too early. That's the trick, is uh, trying to stay in the, the consumer's best size that they prefer. Those are barnacles on the, on the mussels. We're definitely seeing more and more of those every year now as well. Here we are. Uh, we'll, going to process the mussels now. Uh, 
We have what they call a brusty clumper that comes from the Netherlands. Uh, it just uh, makes the muscles more individualized and uh, takes some of the barnacles off. And uh, you'll see right here is the muscles are going into the brusty clumper. They're just brushes that force the muscles in and then there's a small gap in the back of the muscles, in the back of the brushes that allow the declumped muscles to go through. Then they go up a belt to what we call a debissing machine, which the rods turn opposite ways that pinch the beards off the muscles. This is what's going on here on this machine. And from here, they drop down to a, another inspection belt. Uh, a lot of times we have people here picking out clumps or broken muscles or whatnot. Uh, and then they go up this inspection belt and go on to a sizing machine. Uh, the muscles are, are sized not by length, but by width because of the turning on the blades here. Uh, we sell two different sizes, a small and then a large, and then the even smaller size, we actually seed back down. So we're utilizing everything at every harvest. We're not throwing anything away. Uh, is the finished product here, all nice and clean. And right full of meat, no grit. Uh, and then uh, we have found problems getting seed, the clutching naturally in the salt pond. So we have been working with uh, Down East Institute and uh, doing some hatchery stuff for about five years now. And uh, it's really starting to look good now. Uh, we're even doing it by, for color. This is our harvest barge, which we've had for four years now picture of uh, the deck and these are our blonde mussels that we're getting through the hatchery. We're, we're, harvest, we're spawning them for the color. Uh, we just want to do something that is uh, different from everybody else. So uh, we're looking into the future and trying to figure out ways to make everything better and more sub sustainable. Uh, so I guess that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. That was very interesting. Nice. I hope everybody got to see that that video there. Um, I'm going to find myself. There I am. I'm back. Great. So uh, we heard about seaweed and, uh, and that form of uh, rope culture for uh, mussels. Now I want to turn to Fiona de Koning, who also grows mussels with, with her operation called Acadia Aqua Farms. And... Um, I think, Fiona, I need to make you a co-host so you can share your screen. Should be able to now. I've shared it. I've lost you at the moment because I've got, I can't see you. So can you see it? Not yet. Okay. Just yesterday with Chelsea. Does that work now? No, I don't see your screen. And slide your person to put a set it in Zoom. A share screen. I got it. Hi, Alec. Hang on, it's this one, right? PowerPoint. Yep, and then share. Share. Let's go to from the beginning. Are you just seeing one slide now, or are you seeing a lot of uh, small ones on the side? We're seeing all the whole PowerPoint on the side, so go ahead and hit the show from the beginning. Yep. Yeah. Now you're now, on. Okay, sorry about that. So, hello everybody. Um, so my husband, Teo, and I, together with our two sons, Max and Alex, own and operate Hollander and De Koning Mussel Farms, which is Acadia Aqua Farms in and around Bar Harbor. We use the bottom or seabed culture technique to grow mussels and a 74 foot converted US Army landing craft as our fan farm vessel. 
Vastly simplified, there are three stages for this method of farming, access to seed, growing in husbandry and processing and distribution. This is just a quick show of uh, the reproductive cycle of the blue mussel. It's very similar to a lot of bivalves. But first of all, let's take a look at the seed access part. We are currently using a protocol we developed for harvesting seed that naturally sets in the wild. In Maine, these are typically in intertidal areas. We based our protocol on the system developed in the Netherlands that achieved third party certification from the Marine Stewardship Council. This seed resource needs to be managed very carefully and I will attempt to explain this in a bit more detail as it is complex and multifactorial. This part of our operation is by far the most collaborative as the intertidal areas in Maine have many stakeholders and like the subtitle areas, they are held by the state in public trust for all Maine citizens. We have tried hard to connect with our neighbours and other stakeholders to listen and learn about the other perspectives in order to fit our activities in alongside them as seamlessly as possible. And for the most part, this has worked quite well for us. We perform an annual geographical survey to locate the seed areas and to survey each one to begin to prioritise seed that may not survive over the winter. We look at the quality, quantity, physical vulnerability and ease of harvest, amongst other things. At this point, we will also talk with the municipal local shellfish committees and the main state department of marine resources area biologists to find out what else might be going on in these areas like uh, clam restoration, for example. This enables us to work around other projects or areas of specific interest. The area biologists of, often survey the flats to bring their expertise to bear on the decisions we make about timing and other practical factors. It may be good to mention here that most of this is above and beyond what is required by regulation, but we have found it to be very beneficial all round. We also have a vessel tracking system on the boat and have shared the login information with the DMR so we have added a further layer of transparency. The timing of the seed harvest is important for several reasons, one of which is the amount of natural predation. If the seed set is very dense, the seed can begin to die, which attracts starfish, for example. If this, this photo shows how they begin to gather and form a mat over the seed to assist, assist the seed in, in its process of expiring, as it were. They also seem to increase their own production due to the availability of a large food source, which is really cool, but um, problematic for the farm. Our goal is to current, carefully thin out the seed rather than clear cut the bank. The volume of harvest does vary a bit depending on several factors, but is often around the 50% mark. This allows both the seed that is removed to a good farm site location and the seed remaining on the seed bank a greater chance of survival to sexual maturity. Studies in the Netherlands have shown that by this method of seed management, the total biomass increases by 12 to 15 percent, so there's no net depletion. Another threat to wild seed banks is in Maine is ice. If the full set of mussel seed is left until spring, then some areas, in some areas, ice sheets will scour the seed off the bank and literally plow the seed into the deep in piles, where again, most of it will die or be eaten. And even if ice doesn't get them, we see that one night can be enough for a 30% mortality of the bank if a cold night and a low water tide uh, coincide. We can see that the climate is changing. There's a lot of change going on. And one effect we have seen is that mussel seed recruitment, which is already episodic, has become even less reliable. This is one reason why we are currently moving forward with a seed collection system. This system is new to the United States, but has been tried and tested in many places worldwide. The idea behind this system is to provide a settlement substrate for the tiny mussels in the water column. By keeping them away from the seabed and the associated um, predators for a little longer than normal, we interrupt the predation enough to allow them to grow and be more resilient before they are transplanted to the farm. Seed collection has been very successful in Europe and is now widely used by very many farmers. 
Although this change is expensive and increases the seed cost significantly, it will overall decrease our, our footprint and maximise the productivity of our existing farm sites. We were fortunate enough to be able to work with Dr. Lauren Ross and her team from the University of Maine when they were working on a hydrodynamic study of particulate distribution in our area. This study has been very valuable to help us target optimum seed collection sites. As part of the fun part of the work that we do, we engage with our local community and schools. The local elementary school comes to visit and check out our touch tank and we have several different classes visit us annually from the high school and from the University of Maine. We are also proud to be a field trip destination for the Eastern Maine Skippers Program, an initiative started by the Maine Centre for Coastal Fisheries. This program is designed to engage and enhance the learning opportunities for some high school students to complete the curriculum looked at through a maritime industry lens. Maritime professions have traditionally been learned over a long period of time and are often generational. In our family, Theo is a fifth generation mussel farmer from the Netherlands whose farming family have been farming mussels since the 1700s. His great grandfather used to harvest by sale and bring the product to a market in Belgium in Antwerp. It was hard physical work. It is not always a walk in the park now either. This photo is of Theo and Max standing on sea ice in the middle of the bay after the US Coast Guard icebreaker had opened up access to one of our farms so that we could supply our customers that winter. This was last year, offloading in a snowstorm and still smiling. And then there are the underwater issues like a submerged pump breakdown in February. This is Alex and he volunteered to do this. If it's really tough, we usually have a family member do it. The pilot house of the stewardship has the specialized equipment that, combined with the general knowledge that Theo brings, enables us to work with precision. We have to be constantly monitoring, evaluating and adapting what we do. To lift the muscles off the bottom, we use a specially designed box drag. This, in conjunction with a computer controlled winch system, ensures minimal impact on the seabed during harvest. The mussels are constantly kept sprayed or immersed in seawater from the moment they come on board to the time they are shipped out. We have a team of 15 people with year round jobs. This is Rudy, who won the nicest smile competition in our company. The mussels look like this when they are landed. And as you can see, we're not quite finished with getting them ready to go. A boom truck and our 27, Carolina, 27 foot Carolina skiff work well enough as a dock for offloading as long as we keep the uh, boat ramps ploughed in the winter time. So the boat day is done. Uh, we have a two, a two day process to get them out to market. Boat day is done and, and we just leave her at anchor by the farm site. The drive to the processing plant is about five minutes. We built this plant in 2016. Well, 2015 really, and then it burned down and then we built it again. And lucky for us, Evan Young was our previous landlord and helped us out big time that year. We can now keep the packing crew and mussels sheltered from the weather and have a great supply of salt water for the mussels via a salt water intake. The following morning, the mussels are cleaned, graded and de-bearded, much in a similar process to uh, what you saw on Evan's farm. Uh, on a line that Alex built more well, designed and mostly built himself. And again, the last, uh, the last inspection, we, we, we have people, only three people, but three people on a picking line, just to make sure that they're ready to go in the bag. They are then weighed, bagged and tagged, ready for packing in boxes or vats, in saltwater slurry ice, that gives the mussels a very quick deep chill, which increases their shelf life. Also, the saltiness helps to maintain the flavour of Maine, and it also saves a lot of backbreaking work shoveling ice onto the product. And all this work over the years gets us to this, the final result. Following family tradition, this one wants to be on the picking line, which she actually can't even reach yet. But the last and best part of our quality control is to regularly eat the mussels with family and friends. And that is me, done. Thank you, Fiona. 
Can you unshare that? There we go. All right, that's Fiona de Koning, another method for, um, for cultivating muscles. Where did I go? It doesn't matter. Oh, here I am. So our final speaker here um, is another shellfish grower, fisherman, longtime fisherman from Stonington area, Marsden Brewer. And I believe I'm going to share Marsden's screen. Let me pull that out. This one here. Okay, Marsden, you're on. All right. Well, I'm Marsden Brewer. I'm a commercial fisherman down in Stonington. Uh, been catching scallop larvae for 20 odd years. Went to Japan four years ago to see how they grew scallops over there. Uh, that's a picture of myself and my son. We work together on it. Uh, at my age, this project's more about the future than about me. Uh, but I truly believe in our coastal fishing communities. And I recognize the problems that we're having with resource. Uh, we're down to mostly just lobsters and that seems to be dwindling. So, you know, this is about putting another tool in the toolbox is what it's been for us. We've been selling scallops for about three years now. Uh, next slide, Bill. That's the visual impact of a scallop farm. Uh, the lines are kept 20 feet underwater at low water. So, you know, most anything in the bay can pass over it. Uh, next slide, Paul. Okay, this is what it looks like underwater. Uh, the first bags you're seeing are lantern nets. They're, they're what we grow in. Uh, this, this is from an aquarium in Japan. Uh, so the lantern nets, they're suspended off an underwater long line. It's got, we tried the Japanese anchors, they didn't work. We got two and a half ton rocks holding the ends. That seems to work pretty good, granite blocks. The next set of gear that you see, uh, pearl, pearl nets, the Japanese use them a lot. Uh, we, we're more happy with the lantern nets, to be honest with you. The next one is uh, uh, the lines with all the scallops on it, something some of you have probably heard of. It's called ear hanging. Uh, the scallops are actually pinned to the line in pairs with a agate pin, a plastic pin. It breaks off about five kilos of pressure. Uh, you get really good growth. The shells aren't sitting on bottom or even in the bottom of a lantern net. So they tend to cup out on both sides. It gives you a better meat. Uh, Fiona and Alex are playing with that. Uh, they just got a machine to further that one. It, in the area that I'm fishing, well, growing up, it probably won't work just because of the amount of tide and stuff we got here. Uh, the last green bags that you're seeing on that line are called spat bags. And that's what we use to catch the larvae in the water column. Uh, we don't catch them on the long line, we catch them down the foot of the bay on the edge of the east main coastal current. So that's a real important part. The settlement is time specific. We know when they spawn, we know how long the larvae stays in the water column. So what we do is we set out to give the larvae a clean piece of earth to hold on to. As most of you realize that the greatest competition in life is for a piece of this earth to hold on to and call your own. It doesn't matter whether you're a grain of wheat competing with a weed out in the Midwest or the Israelis and the Palestinians over on the West Bank. Uh, but by, by doing that, we give them a good chance, a real good stat. And they're the dominant species, and we bring them in, put them on the line, spread them out, and grow them from there. Next one. That's, that's our line. Uh, we're lifting it up to put it on the 
style wheels. Uh, this picture, just to give you some idea what it looks like in the water. Uh, there's no, we don't use our buoys on top. We don't use buoys on top of the water and suspend our lines down because scallops tend to get seasick in the wave action. In the wave action. So we hold the line down with weights and then suspend it up uh, with balls that are submerged. It's a little different. Okay, next one, Paul. Yeah. There we go. We also use some specialized equipment. Uh, what we're working on there, the back piece of machinery is a sorter, a grader. We can grade all kinds of different sizes with different screens. The machine in front of it's a scallop washer. Uh, that's made our life a whole lot easier. We just, the co-op, uh, the main aquaculture co-op is formed around the development of scallop farming. And we got, just got a, another grant from the main aquaculture hub to purchase a net washer. All this equipment's necessary to scale it up. And well, we've been doing it for three years. We're the first in the country in Maine doing it. So this is a lot of expensive equipment. It's a lot of, a lot of learning. Uh, it's been good. And it's been a lot of help from a lot of different organizations. Next one. Yeah, and this is the inside of Scala. What, we, what we're doing different, we're not uh, selling just the duct to mussels like you normally eat. We sell the whole Scala. Uh, and on the inside, these, on the smaller scallops, the two inch stuff, two, two and a half, the whole inside's edible and really tasty. We take off the stomach and we recommend people take off the stomach because if there is biotoxins, that's where they're stored, 80 yard percent of them. But they're really special treat. Yeah, instead of throwing half the uh, protein away, you're showing a little more respect for the animal and utilizing all the protein in it. Go ahead. So, when you try and sell a whole skull up in Maine and no one's eaten them before around here, you have to think outside the box a little. So, we've got a book coming out this fall that uh, a friend of mine, Manny Crow, wrote. We worked together to put it together. So, you know, it's just, it's a brand new product. We're trying to create demand for it. It seems to be working out good. Uh, next one, Paul. One of the biggest problems, committing more than you can. You can see the scallops pair well with mussels and lobsters and all kinds of local stuff. Uh, that's a really good meal right there. Next one, Paul. Yeah. Okay. A lot, a lot of times people will ask me who my customers are, you know, who buys these whole scallops? And I tell them it's some of the best chefs in the country and some of the best restaurants in the country. These scallops were uh, stuff we shipped this week to Los Angeles uh, to a chef that communicates with his customers real well and is real handy with making stuff taste good. So, and that's all of it, Paul, I think. Is it, is that it? Yeah, that's it. Yep, that's Yeah, and- There we go, thank you, Marston, nice job. Yeah, well, there's one, one more thing. It's, uh, you know, with this scallop famine, well, with all the famine, all these are restorative and regenerative everything you guys have heard about today. And it's, uh, it's really good stuff. But as we look forward on this, uh, Kevin kind of touched on it with his three acres on his lease site. Currently in Maine, you can have up to 100 acres and you can have 10 of those. Uh, you know, I like the idea of scaling that production on shore, but you know, on the water, it needs to be down to a scale that fits our community, not necessarily three acres, but 
uh, you know, a thousand acres, it don't take too many people before you've lost your community. Uh, you know, we need to look at it. We need to size it so that it works for the communities. Uh, I'm going to leave it there, Paul. Okay. Well, I want to thank all four of our panelists for sharing um, their expertise and these great images of their operations. Uh, did a nice job of timing. So we have um, we have about 15 minutes anyway for questions and, and uh, that we can try to answer for you. I don't know, Pat, do you have any um, queued up there that you want to send to the panelists? I know we had a couple before the event that I can pull up if we need to. Uh, yes, we did have um, a couple of questions before. I've got uh, two here uh, that I'll start with. Um, uh, let's see, when does your winter season usually start? Um, and when in spring does it usually conclude? And that's for Sarah. Well, it depends on what you're growing. Um, but in general, you put your seed out September through October, and then you harvest April, May, June. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, from uh, Heidi Nolan, our adult education program is looking to develop an aquaculture program at our CTE school. What recommendations do you have for programming elements that are necessary to teach in terms of workers what are the critical education elements they should have? Uh, and that's for nobody in particular, so anybody can jump in. Well, if I was looking to hire someone to work for me on my scholar farm, I'd be looking for someone with five years commercial fishing experience. Uh, they've already developed uh, the, they developed the skill set that you need to do anything you want on the water. If I was looking for, if you're talking, I'm sorry, could you read the question again? Was it actually focused on, on education, Pad? Yeah, yes, uh, adult education program. I think a lot of this would be hands-on learning. So a lot of my focus is, is normally on, you know, are people reliable, the, the normal employment skills? Are they reliable? Are they enthusiastic for the job? Are they good team players? Do they pay attention to safety? That kind of stuff. Uh, Evan, you want to weigh in? Or? Yeah, sure. Uh, I would say uh, quality control. People that uh, would take the time and effort to uh, do their best and uh, just like they were going to eat the food themselves. Uh, no shortcuts, uh, just uh, doing the best job they can do and uh, be as good as they can to the product, the animals. Great. Thank you, Evan. Um, I've got a couple of questions that came in before the webinar started. Um, are farm shellfish susceptible uh, to any diseases which can threaten the entire harvest? We should have an oyster farmer on here for this one, really. They, they definitely have some problems with things that will threaten the entire harvest. I, I'm not sure that we do as mussel farmers. What about you, Marsden? We, have, we don't have any problems so far, but you know, we're, we're writing the book as we go. The, uh, the biggest problem I see is just the invasive species, uh, the biofouling and uh, organisms changing in time. Yeah, Fiona brings up a good point. We could certainly have added a, an oyster grower to our panel here today. Um, and as many people may know, from what I understand, there are some fairly chronic oyster problems, uh, diseases that have cropped up around the country, primarily in warmer waters. Um, but there's been a whole effort to, uh, to breed um, resistance to some of those uh, agents. They're, they're parasitic and uh, um, bacterial and other kinds of problems like that. I'm not sure we have excessive problems here in Maine, but. Um, it's a great question. Good 
one might be a little bit of a softball. Uh, thin fish farmers have been accused of causing pollution because of the fecal and other waste from their operations um, and because of the feed that they introduce into the water. Are either of these issues faced by shellfish farmers? Aha, uh -huh, this is a great question. <laughs> No, absolutely not. In fact, we have, as shellfish farmers and seaweed farmers, um, there's a lot of documentation that we actually improve the ecological situation. They, they, they call them, what do they call them, Sarah, eco-services is what they sort of study for those things. So uh, sea seaweed and shellfish farms remove nitrogen and phosphates they filter the water out and they create basically uh, human consumable protein from them. So they are, they are excellent, actually. Answer question, carbon in the shells. Cool. Um, let's see. Uh, from Aaliyah, uh, this is for Evan. The cotton that's wrapped around the baby mussels, is it a dissolvable cotton? Um, and uh, the second question from her is, could you talk a little bit more about the blonde mussels? Yeah, yeah the cotton completely dissolves after three to four weeks. Uh, it's 100% cotton, um, so it does completely dissolve. Uh, the blonde mussels are, are actually a blue mussel that we have just selected our broodstock of blondes that have been naturally set, and those are the only ones who are spawning in the hatchery to create uh, lines that are all blonde mussels. Uh, and every year that we have done it, we've gotten, say the first year we had 40% blondes come out. Uh, and then each generation is producing more blondes than not the blue mussels. So it's actually been pretty fun and uh, fun to do something different. Thanks, Evan. Um, this is from Nicole. Uh, how are you making your businesses more sustainable and how has the pandemic impacted your business? How have you ad adapted to this disruption? Uh, let's start with Fiona. Do I look most disrupted? <laughs> 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 how have we made it more sustainable? Well, Given that we're at the lower end of the gene pool of aquaculture anyway, with shellfish farming, they're pretty sustainable by their very nature. I mean, we're using a technique that has been used since the time of Napoleon, and with some tweaking and some extra monitoring, it's not changed a great deal. So sustainability is important, but there's, you know, Teo's fifth generation, the boys another six. I think there's a chance that we, we can carry on. Our biggest threat, of course, is the change to the climate. So that that part we are we're not so confident about. Uh, what was the other part of the question? Sustainability and pandemic yeah. has been. I think it's probably directly affected or indirectly affected pretty much every facet of all of our lives. Quite honestly, it's it's been. Um, it, it's been scary, then, it's, then it seems to be settling down, then another threat comes. I mean, in the beginning, when it first hit back in March, um, we, we, didn't, we shut down completely. We had to kind of gather stock. I had to take care of my people, and that was my predominant care at the time. We also opened up our, um, our building uh, to selling locally, which we don't. We're a wholesaler, but we, we started to sell to the local community because, believe it or not, there were food challenges supermarkets were empty people wanted good healthy seafood to eat whilst they're learning to you know do more cooking at home so we we had people stop by curbside stuff on the in the um, parking lot which was great we got to meet some really good people and it's nice to make that connection um and we and we also supplied the local food pantry but since then um what's different we we've got we've got plastic curtains hanging between all our people we've got masks so we are trying to talk to each other and our machines are quite noisy we can't hug them in the morning i mean there's all sorts of things have changed where um you know and they're going to be like that for some time so it's making it more difficult because that personal connection element we're missing um as far as the market it it's it's stronger than i had expected it to be i mean really i'm still selling everything that we can produce so as far as that concerned, it, it's not as bad as many, but um, that, can, that can change overnight too. You know, we don't really know. The uncertainty is difficult. 
Thanks. Uh, I'm just gonna, um, add, does anybody have anything to add to that? Seeing none, I'll move to the next question. This is from William. Um, what did uh, each of you do before you were aquaculturists and how did that set you up for what your current operation is? Uh, let's start with, uh, how about Evan? Well, uh, I, uh, I worked on a, uh, a salmon farm, uh, so I was on the water quite a bit, uh, did a lot of commercial diving, urchin and scallopin, uh, and it's pretty much just been working on the water, doing whatever I had to do to, to get things going. I'm just going to go down the line. Sarah. Uh, I wanted to be a seaweed farmer when I was in high school, um, but it didn't exist. So I worked on all kinds of boats um, and, and then I was a fisheries observer. So I worked on in the fishing industry and worked on lobster boats. And uh, then I worked as a sea grant agent for seaweed farming for a number of years. And then finally uh, started the seaweed business I have now. Fiona. You want me, not the rest of the team, presumably. <laughs> the, real, the real people who farm are the people who've done it all their lives, so they haven't done anything before. And in fact, he knows nothing about anything else, but he knows an awful lot about muscles. So for me, I trained, I have a, a master's degree in diagnostic imaging. So what did I learn? People is what I learned. How to be with people, how to understand, get empathy, sympathy, understanding of the situations that people find themselves in. And believe it or not, business is people. Okay. Uh, I started on the, <laughs> I started on over the weekend muscle trips to the north of Holland when I was four years old. That was Alex. I'm not. I should have really introduced him. He didn't. He does that anyway. Marsden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's really pretty sustainable to begin with, uh, holding the scallops together in those lantern nets for shellfish that broadcast spawn us. So they need close proximity to each other for successful fertilization. So when you've got a lantern net with 130 uh, reproductive adults in it, all held in close proximity, all spawning at the same time, you you're looking at probably coming out with a pretty good success rate. So I, I expect we're putting a lot more larvae in the water than what we're taking out of it. Uh, the pandemic shut us, shut us down in March. Uh, you know, a couple, couple three months, that everyone just trying to figure it out. Uh, seems now things are getting better. Uh, businesses are Oh, the takeout's happening for some of your better restaurants. Uh, customers still like to eat good food. They like they don't want to go into restaurants these days, but uh, we're getting through it. It's working, and we we didn't lose any product over it. They just kept growing, got worth more. So uh, it's hasn't been much of an issue. I've got a pandemic related question to dovetail onto that. Um, are there um, any infrastructure investments or programs that you wish were in place to help decrease the impacts down east? That's a, that's a difficult question because, you know, some of the work that we do is, is, because there's not too much infrastructure around, but it would always make it easier if there was like some kind of community dock that would be able to land things. I mean, getting stuff ashore can be pretty difficult, particularly if you're, you, you get to work in the winter time. Yeah, I think um, not, even, not, not even having to do with the pandemic, we need infrastructure up and down our coast, especially in down east, we have um, hundreds of years of dilapidated infrastructure, but no one's been investing in working waterfront. No one's looking at the future. We have um, systems that are uh, 
we're going to lose if we don't start to really pay attention to this problem. And we can't grow new industries without infrastructure and we need support um, from the state and federal levels. That's for sure. It makes me feel awful lucky to fish, live and fish in Stonington, work out of Stonington. I'm, I'm sitting here looking at the town pier right now with five heisters and one big chain ice case, something's heavy. And it, it took a lot of work. It was back in the 80s, but we, you know, come in at the same time, Portland got that fish pier. Uh, we're doing an expansion on it now, small expansion. It constantly keeping your eyes out for opportunities seems to be what helps us get by with it. Uh, how are we doing on time, Paul? We got time for a couple more? Um, I th well, we're, we're at the end of our hour, so I put up our general slide here to uh, thank folks for, um, for joining us. Um, I noted there was a, several questions about the COVID. I think we covered some of that. If you want to uh, pick one or two more, Pat, and we understand people may need to leave. Uh, sure. Um, this one's from Phoebe. Uh, what do the panelists see as their greatest challenge to entry for each of the species? Let's start with uh, uh, Sarah. Well, entry to aquaculture, I'm assuming. Um, I think it depends on which which species you're, you, you're trying to farm, but um, certainly it's infrastructure is huge. You need infrastructure to do all of this. And if you're doing something like you can see the uh, shellfish um, production requires significant amount of seeding and processing machinery and infrastructure, and you need people to do that. So um, a lot of investment there. And then with seaweed, it's, uh, it's, relatively low tech to have a farm and grow your product but again it's processing so um, we work with people that are interested in getting involved with seaweed to um, share with them our model which is um, be certified organic and then be able to own your own or work with somebody to dry your own product so that we can create a network of organic growers in Maine that can work together and sell into bigger markets. Um, and so in terms of being able to process your own product, it's, it's sim as simple as a, a few greenhouses, but that's still infrastructure. And in Maine, we tend to have, we tend to be rich in sort of land. Um, there's a lot of, of private landowners that would be interested, but we need help actually building that basic infrastructure. So, I mean, in the case of seaweed, it's, it's infrastructure, and in the case of shellfish, it's infrastructure. And, and that's sort of the challenge of getting going, and that's where we really need some wider support to, to help these industries um, move forward. Anybody else wanna to add to that? I've got uh, one more question after. Yeah, I I would um, I would agree with Sarah to a great a great extent. I think perhaps another one that we need to think about is access to capital. Again, it depends a little on your on your growing uh, method and the species you choose. But um, access to capital, particularly to people who are just starting up and don't have any experience in the business, can be quite challenging. So I think there needs to be um, a focus also on processing and distribution that is still behind and um, it's not the most efficient, even though that's our model as well, and I'm happy with it, but it's not the most efficient for aquaculture as a sector to have processing and distribution at each separate farm organization. So if we really want to encourage this to be a, 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 a valuable, an even more valuable economic driver for coastal Maine communities. We're going to have to look at it a little bit like that too, because um, there's an economy of scale and we do have to start to produce enough volume to be taken seriously out in the marketplace. We're getting there and there's potential, there's huge potential. I mean, I can't, I can't emphasize enough what an opportunity there is in Maine here for people who want to do this. But there, there are some kind of clear-headed business de decisions and focuses that will need to be um, looked at. 
There's a, a question here from Marsden. How can you tell when a scallop gets seasick? How can you tell when a scallop gets seasick? <laughs> well, I got that from the Japanese. Uh, it, it, it tends to affect the growth. It uh, will actually they'll dodge at times. Uh, and there's some things I just took at face value from the Japanese, and I didn't question it. They got 50 years of experience in it. If they tell me they get seasick, I'm going to tell you where they get seasick. I'm not going to argue with them. Uh, one last question here. And, and um, uh, just so you know, that there are a lot more questions on here. We don't have time for them all. Um, I apologize if we didn't get to yours. But consider yourself introduced to these people. Um, and and uh, we'll make sure that you all have their contact information. You can reach out with your questions directly. Um, this um, uh, last question is, if I wanted to start a sea farm, scallops, mussels, seaweed, whatever, um, how do you, uh, where do you recommend that I begin? Um, I would reach out to either farmers who are already doing it or the, or, or the DMR and or the Maine Aquaculture Association. There's a lot of expertise out there. There are a lot of organizations, the Sea Grant. Uh, there are lots of people who want to help you. Um, call me and I'll gather a, lo a lot of names and numbers for you and I'll help you along the way. Yeah, and I think I think if you reach out to people in the industry, they're more than willing to sort of give you some direction. And if you're interested in seaweed, I can certainly help. And we also have the uh, Maine Seaweed Exchange. It's a nonprofit, and we offer training and workshops and resources for people interested in seaweed. Yeah, and the main the main uh, aquaculture co-op on scallops is probably a good place to start. Between that and the all right well I'd like to um, thank all of our panelists for spending their time with all of you today and thank you for attending uh, thank you Pat for helping out with the questions and uh, I thought that was very informative we did record this and um, videos of this webinar along with uh, the whole series from the summer are available at the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries website and we hope you'll um, visit our website and uh, check out some of the other things that we're doing. And if you're ever in Stonington, stop by and say hello. We have two more of these planned for the season. We'll do one at the end of uh, September, where Dr. Carla Gunther and I will talk about an exciting project we're working on with ecosystem-based fisheries management in Eastern Maine. And then um, I think we finish our season with with Pat Shepard, who's on the screen with you, and he'll be talking about a collaborative research project that he's working on with fishermen uh, studying the, the ground fish in this part of the region as we uh, hope to see some recovery in that fishery. So thank you again, panelists, for being with us, and I hope everybody uh, stays well and stays safe, and uh, we'll see you around the neighborhood. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks for having us, Paul.